بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. So inshallah ta'ala this uh, evening we're going to take a look at a couple of manners um, most important to the student of knowledge and hopefully uh, our dear brother uh, Sheikh Abdul Aziz uh, last night discussed and inspired you enough with uh, some pertinent information about the benefits of learning and the virtues of knowledge and then shared with you some of the struggles that the pious have gone through in search of uh, coming into awareness of Allah subhanahu, learning more about their faith and how to um, and how to journey to Allah in the home of the hereafter. So the manners, of course, are extremely important because our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he came to perfect uh, manners. He came to perfect and to complete uh, manners and all what is considered lofty characteristic to nobility. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam being the best of mankind, he uh, exemplified the best of manners. And taking him as our example, we have to understand and know for a fact that everything that we do and embark upon, there's going to be some manners that should be adopted in the process. So first and foremost, the most important of manners is without a doubt to purify your heart. Is to purify your heart. A person that's interested in seeking knowledge has to purify their heart from any ill feelings, any jealousy or malice. They should purify their heart from any misguided beliefs and evil manners. And the reason for this purification of the heart, the reason that it's important is that the pure heart is that which is ready to accept the knowledge of our faith. Not only to accept it, but also to preserve it and hold it within the pure heart that the heart is able to comprehend the detailed meanings of our faith, to have a deep understanding of its reality. They say that knowledge is the secret prayer, Salatul Sir. It's the hidden prayer. It's a worship of the heart. It's an inner devotion, if you will. And just as the prayer as Salah requires purification, meaning we have to make wudu, we have to take the ghusl at times, in order for our prayers to be accepted, the heart also requires purification for it to receive knowledge. Because the knowledge is like what they call ibadatul qalb, worship of the heart which is not accepted and it is not valid unless the heart has been purified from lowliness and vile characteristics and qualities. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said in a hadith, إِنَّ فِي الْجَسَدِ مُضْغَةِ That in the body there is a morsel, إِذَا صَلَحَتْ صَلَحَ الْجَسَدُ كُلُّهُ that when it is pure and whole, the rest of the body is pure and whole. Well, either fasadat, fasad al jasadu kullu. That if it is corrupt, if it is diseased, then the body will be corrupt and diseased. Allah wa al qalb. None other than the heart. So this is utmost and this is a primer, a first step. Is the heart has to be pure, it has to be cleansed of 
foulness and disease, of wickedness and hatred, of jealousy, of these ill feelings that are held in one's heart in order for it to be open now to receive knowledge. Coupled with that in the heart is a pure intention. As we said here that the seeking of knowledge of Islam is something that is worship. It's a qurba batina. It's a hidden devotion. And we know that in Islam all acts of devotion and, and, and merit that will be rewarded have to be done sincerely for the sake of Allah subhanahu. So the student of knowledge has to beautify their intention and they intend by their seeking the pleasure of Allah the Most High. That they can learn and then they can act, apply that knowledge. And in the process of learning and acting, they are bringing life to the sharia. They're going to enliven the law of Allah subhanahu. That they're going to bring light into their heart. That they will draw nearer to Him. They will draw near to Him subhanahu. And they will gain through it His pleasure. It was mentioned by Abu Yusuf, rahimahullah. He said, He says, O oh people, you should desire with your knowledge, you should desire Allah subhanahu. He says, For I do not sit, he says, I do not sit, Lam ajlis majlisan, I do not sit in the circles, if you will. أن ويفيه أن أتواضع إلا لم أقم حتى أعلوهم. He says there, I do not sit in the circles, the gatherings of knowledge in which I have intended to humble myself in them. Right, as a means of humility. Except that by the end of the gathering, I have been raised above all of them. And I don't sit in the circles of knowledge, the gatherings of knowledge, having intended to be raised in status among them, except that I have been exposed for it. So the intention is king. The intention is, it is king. So whoever is able to direct their intention to Allah sincerely for their seeking of knowledge to gain His pleasure, to act upon it, and to enliven the sharia, three important things. Right? What do you intend? What do you intend when you begin the pursuit of knowledge? What should your intention be? From these intentions are these three things. Just in case you were asked that. Hint, hint. So a person, if they're able to purify their heart and then to intend by their seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with this sincere intention, walaykum salam, then their actions will be accepted. They will be purified and the blessing of it will have been completed. If they intend something else, they intend to seek knowledge for some other reason, then it will be rendered null and void any merit of it. It will be lost and the person will have missed out on achieving their aims and objectives. They will have wasted all of the effort that they put themselves through seeking the knowledge of Islam. This is number two. Number three is they take advantage of time and they manage it well. This is key for a student of knowledge. The first two are the inner workings of the heart. This is a struggle that the student of knowledge will continue throughout their seeking, throughout their quest. It will be something that they struggle with day in and day out to do what they're doing sincerely for Allah. Not looking for fame or for glory or for uh, marrying a second wife or third wife or whatever. Because of their status and position, not throwing their weight around in the masjid because of who they are and the title that they've been given, not to have a hundred million thousand views and friends on Facebook and Twitter and the social medias, but that they are sincerely seeking it for Allah, 
to remove ignorance from themselves, to live their life according to the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and thus bringing life to it. And then they take advantage of their time from a practical perspective here as what students are required in terms of manners. And they manage their time, right? So some of the imams of the past, the great pious, they would say that the best times to memorize the best times for memorization are in the early hours of the morning. Al-Ashar. You know, uh, Sahur. What is Sahur? Good. The early meal. early meal. Before what time? Before Fajr time. It's still dark outside. Do you know why they call it Suhoor? Suhoor? It has to do with Sihr. Magic. Sihr is that which is hidden from the eyes. Some type of action that is hidden from the eyes. Magic. Sihr. So Suhoor is called the pre-dawn meal because it's hidden from the eyes of the people. It's dark out still. No one sees you. And so here, al-ashar is that time where no one is able to see you. It is still dark out. He says the good times for uh, research it is in the morning time early, before noon. Writing a good time for it is in the day. And reading and studying, reviewing and revising is a good time, is found in the night. The great Imam al-Khatib al-Baghdadi, he said similar to this, that the good time for memorization is in the morning times, pre-dawn. And then after that, wasat al-Nahab, in the middle of the day. And then later on in the evening. He says, however, memorizing things at night is more beneficial than it is in the daytime. He says here, That being hungry is more beneficial in terms of memorizing than being full. Right? When we're full, all of the blood it goes to, to the belly to help. It's a lot of energy that's expended that, uh, Digesting the food. So when you're hungry, you're less likely to be tired. And this is important that each person, when it comes to the memorization, revision, reading, this is a general, a general tried and true type of a, a chart for the student of knowledge to use. It may not work for everybody. Someone may be different. So everyone has to pick preferred times they see work, which work best for them and stick with those times to take advantage of the moment, to seize the opportunity uh, when your mind is most fresh and you are most alert, able to receive information, whether it's just to read or to review, or then the times preferred for memorization. The next thing, number four, is that the student of knowledge watches his diet, his or her diet, believe it or not. This is important when seeking knowledge because it has an effect on the body. So from the greatest, most impacting means which assist the student of knowledge in their work and in their understanding is that they eat small portions of halal. So small portions of halal means it, not big portions, certainly not haram. Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah. You recognize this name? Yes. One of the greats. He said, I have not filled myself 
in 16 years. SubhanAllah. In 16 years, I have not filled my belly. So try to think, can we get six days since that? Listen to this. The reason for that is because eating a great deal of food requires that you drink a lot. He says, then which requires for you to sleep a lot. Your mind becomes heavy and lazy. The body becomes tired and weak. Not to mention the fact that it's considered makruh in the Islamic law to fill yourself. It was never seen from the pious of the past, from the awliya, if you will, or a'emmat as-salaf, the great imams from the scholars, that they were characterized as people that ate a great deal. Nor did they encourage people to eat a great deal. But they encouraged people and they praised those that maintained a small, balanced diet. A person should only consume that which is needed to continue to find the energy necessary in their seeking of knowledge and their quest. Another practical perspective of this is that the more you eat and the more you drink, the more you have to do what? You have to go to the restroom. Yeah. They hit every point. So when you have to go to the, be the restroom, what do you have to do? You have to put down your books. You have to stop your train of thought. You have to leave your studies. Then you have to go to the restroom. And you have to spend five, 10, 15 minutes handling your business. And then you come back. Right? So there's time there. You see, precious moments have been lost. Just in this natural, halal, required human process, moments, they used to see these moments as precious. So instead of eating a lot and I have to make trips to the bathroom all day long, I'll eat less, I'll save time, and I won't be visiting the restroom so much. From the great imams of the past, they used to take um, their meals uh, fast food. Yeah, the fast food. They preferred quick foods over big meals, preparation, and to sit down, three courses, five courses, presenting over an hour or two. They liked the fast food, bread and water. Instead of taking drinking and then eating, they would just pour the water on the bread and one time, boom. Fast food. Because time was the greatest resource for a student of knowledge. You can't buy knowledge. You can't download it can't upload it, but you have to sit with it and you have to repeat, learn, understand, and memorize, and that takes time. So that's your most precious resource as a student of knowledge. If there's anyone that has achieved great levels of knowledge while having eaten a lot and had drunk a lot and slept a lot, then they have achieved what is normally considered near impossible. It is not because of that but it is in spite of that that they were able to achieve levels if they achieved them at all. And of course, the Prophet Sallallahu from his prophetic tradition, as has been reported in Sunnah Tirmidhi, this hadith, he says that مَا مَلَا أَبْنُ آدَمَ وِيَعْمْ شَرًّا مِنْ بَطْنِ He says there's no more evil vessel for the son of Adam to fill than his own stomach. Sufficient is him for him, sufficient for him is small morsels which will keep his back upright. If he has to, he says here, this is key, because a lot of times we have not understood the nature of this hadith. We know a third for food and a third for drink and a third for to breathe. This is not the standard. 
This is not the standard, this is the maximum. He says, فَإِن كَانَ لَا مَحَالَ If you have no choice, if you are overwhelmed with desire to eat, or you're sitting with someone and they are trying to kill you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Some cultures, they like this. They think that this is a type of, of honor. It is certainly to, to, to supply and to give what you can. But then to... <laughs> To right there on the floor, man. <laughs> Literally, sometimes that happens, you just like you fall out because you've had to eat so much just to make your hosts feel happy. SubhanAllah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says in the Quran, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat and drink and do not be excessive. Do not be excessive. So to eat what is beyond necessity, to consume what is beyond the essentials, then this is considered a type of excessiveness in food and drink. So many of the scholars, they say that within this ayah, Surah Al-A'raf, verse number 31, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has collected in this ayah, Al-Karimat Al-Tib, which is essentially like expressions of medicinal expressions. We were. Medicinal expressions, because Overeating, it leads to disease. They tell you even here in America, what do they tell you now from the number one killers in America is Dr. Ali? Obesity. Obesity. Right? And that comes from overeating. So Allah subhanahu wa commands is وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا وَلَا تُسْرِفُوا Eat and drink and do not be wasteful. So the person seeking knowledge should be aware of uh, the amount of food that they consume. But also, again with food, the types of food that are helpful. Helpful to the memory versus the types of food that can be harmful for the memory. So the imams of the past, they were interested in these topics. And they discovered, whether through personal experience or through their uh, scientific medical understandings, there were different types of food that caused reactions in the body. So you'll find uh, recommending to eat raisins, some of them, as a, as, a, as a brain food. Or honey. They say to stay away from milk. Stay away from fish. They consider these types of things to have an adverse effect on one's memory. Hmm. A student of knowledge should also be wary of their sleep habits. That they should reduce the amount of sleep so long as it does not harm them. So long as it doesn't harm the body nor harm the mind, then they should try and sleep as little as possible. And it should never be more than eight hours in a day. Their sleep should never be more than eight hours in a day. Eight hours is the max, like your food intake, thuluth wa thuluth wa thuluth, should never be beyond that. If a person is sleeping nine or 10 or even 12 hours, some people then like to, to chill out and get their sleep in, their beauty rests. They're not worried about the beauty so much as they're worried about the knowledge. So they try to reduce the amount of sleep. And I can tell you from personal experience that a part of um, study and being diligent is making sacrifices when it comes to sleep. So dealing with the amount of sleep, that they should uh, reduce their amount of sleep as much as possible without harming the body, nor harming the mind. You don't want to overdo it because then you become tired and you cannot concentrate. You should be enough to be refreshed, but not too much to where you're wasting time. Sometimes too much sleep also leads to laziness and lethargy. If you've ever noticed before, you slept over, you slept in a couple more hours and then you wake up and you still feel tired and weary. It leads to lethargy. The next thing is that they uh, take into account intimacy uh, for the brothers that are married or the sisters that are married that are seeking knowledge that intimacy has its place in the talab. Right? So it's been noted, noted that marital relations, intimacy uh, can aid a person if balanced. It can provide uh, energy for the person and it can 
It can clear the mind. We should all understand how this works. The mature folk here that have been married, sometimes the mind is clouded, needs release. However, it should be done in moderation. Not to mention the fact that it should be done halal, intimacy. The doctors of the past, they used to say that it, it uh, brings nashat, brings energy. Yusafid dhihn, clears the mind. إِذَا كَانَ إِنْدَ الْحَاجَ بِاعْتِدَالِ So long as it's done when needed in a balanced, moderate way. An overly active, overly active life, sexual life, uh, it can tire the body, as you would imagine tire the mind, and also requires a person to spend their time doing what? Ghusl. Purify themselves from major ritual impurity. So when a person is a state, in a state of their, in, in, in their junum, in, in the state of janaba, then they don't approach certain things like the Qur'an or their, 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 their talab, but they should purify themselves. And so this would be a moment where they are wasting their times, especially if it was something that was not needed. Number six is that the student of knowledge manages their environment. They manage their environment. The best, most beneficial places for memorization, it is in the rooms. It is in a room somewhere, a small room, a chamber. A room, an office, a study, if you will, that is far away from distraction. It's not something um, praiseworthy or beneficial for you to go trying to learn and memorize things out in the park, by the riverside, by the waterside, out on the roadways where there's lots of noise and traffic and distraction. You need a place where the, the atmosphere does not prevent the heart from concentrating, constantly distracting a person. So sometimes we go, I'm going to take my books and I'm going to go to the park. How much did you study in the park? <laughs> this one's walking by and that one and the dog is coming, oh no, and the car is honking and all of these distractions. And what you could have done in 15 minutes took you an hour and a half. I'm going to take my books and I'm going to go to the coffee shop. That's where I'm going to study at the Starbucks or the Halal Bucks, whatever you like. <laughs> I take my books and I go to the Starbucks and I sit down and what's the Wi-Fi password, please? <laughs> I have to check in and status update, study. Bismillah, take a picture of my book. Bismillah. Seek knowledge of one. Coffee shop, wait, I gotta get my latte, I need a refill, extra cream and a half macchiato. How much time did you actually use in the Starbucks studying? This also has to do with what I was mentioning here, our devices and our tablets and our screens and all of the distractions. So when a person goes to sit down to study, the last thing they want is their WhatsApp. Ding, 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 ding. Oh, mashallah, look, okay, great. Brother Stan, let's go out for lunch. Oh, I was hungry. <laughs> Forget this. So, you have to silence these things. You have to silence these things. And you have to pick appropriate times when to study. If you're a man or a woman of responsibility, particularly those that have children, you don't study in the, the peak of the day when they're coming, mommy, daddy, I need help, homework, please. Oh, I need to change my clothes, I wanna go out. You don't try and study then. You cannot be in two places at one time. Seeking knowledge, studying, memorizing, reviewing. A person has to be focused in their efforts. And the environment has to be set. So this is some good practical advice for today. A lot of us are studying programs online. We have online programs, we're watching uh, lectures, uh, we're enrolled in online things um, where we uh, can benefit. 
long distance, which can be a great tool. And many of our scholars have dedicated some of their time in order to record materials that the student around the globe can access. Knowledge has not been as, as accessible as it is today. Instead of using the YouTube to watch the highlights of the game or to watch the funniest clips, you find our mashaykh. Even from the major scholars of today, their lessons are available online. Whether it's with the video and their voice or just their voice and a person can sit and follow. And I'll tell you this from experience, it would take more than a lifetime to follow any one teacher. In the masjid uh, in Medina, the Prophet's masjid, they have uh, the library of audio recordings, which is available to the public. Every lesson since they started recording is there, saved. You can bring a hard drive or a CD or something and give it to them, and you can request. They have this huge catalog, and you can request what lessons you want to give. So before I graduated, I brought one terabyte, one terabyte, and I gave it to them, and I said, I want everything. It took the entire terabyte. No videos, except a few, all audio lectures. I'll tell you now, I have a strong feeling I'll never make it through that terabyte. <laughs> Even if I sat every day for eight hours listening to that, that uh, treasure chest, the electronic treasure chest, I'll never make it through all of the gold and silver and gems and jewels that are in there. But when you're at home, you have to set your environment. So listen to this. When you're going, and this is advice, this is just sincere advice. When you're going to open up your computer, you should act as if you were sitting in front of your sheikh. You maintain the proper composure, the proper attire. You're not sitting there in your PJs, lounged up on the couch. But you are as if you're sitting in the circle of knowledge. Because there's something about the process that you go through, having the manners. Some would even perhaps prefer that they put the, 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 the screen up and they sit on the floor as if it was a real circle that they were sitting in. The process has a positive effect on the student in terms of becoming humble, humility, lowering oneself, which leads us to the student's manners with his teachers. The student's manners with his teachers are from some of the most important manners of a student of knowledge. And it's something that our generation today is in great need of. The first most important manner, if you will, is selection process. Selecting your teacher. The student of knowledge, they should seek the guidance of Allah subhanahu. They should survey what options they have. Who is it that they would like to sit under? They seek Allah's guidance, al-istikhara is performed, alhamdulillah. Right, so istikhara is the prayer by, by which we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us in our decisions. Not the decision to seek knowledge. There's no need for istikhara because this is amal ta'a. It's an act of righteousness. We don't need to make istikhara for righteous things. Should I pray? Hold on, let's make istikhara. <laughs> No. Should I seek knowledge? This is from the vir most virtuous deeds. But to seek Allah's guidance in whom you will receive this information and knowledge from. Because you will not only receive knowledge, but you will also be gaining manners, etiquettes from that teacher. You will look for someone, if possible, who has completed their studies and they have achieved a level of proficiency 
that they have displayed qualities of compassion. A person that is, has achieved a level of proficiency and knowledge and understanding of the deen, then they will have compassion for the students. A person that it's clear from them that they have honor and dignity. This is what you want in a teacher. Someone that's dignified, honorable, that is respected. Not someone that from them there are certain actions and behaviors that are lowly and detested. They're known as a liar or a cheat. They're known as a sinner or a swindler. If possible, you find the one that has honor. And they are known for their chastity. They are known for their chastity. And you do not limit your selection to the famous. This is also very important in our time and in our culture where oftentimes we are only interested and intrigued when the person that is teaching is a famous person. How many friends does he have on Facebook? How many views do his videos receive? I don't listen to people, they don't have 50,000 friends. I won't seek knowledge from someone that only gets 100 clicks on his videos. Listen, this is not specific to our time. The Imams of the past used to talk about the very thing, that a person doesn't limit their, their selection of who they want to study with to those that are famous and leaving those that are more obscure, unknown. And in my experience, sometimes it's the unknown scholars that are the powerhouses. Obscure name, and I experienced this while I was in Medina. There were the Imams of the Haram, there were the Imams that led the prayer, there were the, the Shuyukh, the Ulama that taught in the lessons, and in the city there were those that were just hidden in their homes, teaching private lessons. And we were only made aware of them when students reached a certain level. You ready for the powerhouse? The Shaykh of the Shuyukh. Unknown. Some of them they prefer it like this. Right? <clears throat> from the Imams of the past, such as Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, and others, they said that if a person restricts themselves to taking knowledge from the famous only, it's considered a form of kibr. <clears throat> What's that mean? Pride, arrogance, conceitedness. That they are arrogant when it comes to knowledge. And he says that they have made this act Ainul Hamaqa. This is the true stupidity. This is real stupidity. For someone to limit themselves in their seeking and their quest. He says, Wisdom, Al Hikmah, Dalatul Mu'min, is a treasure, it's the objective. It's the goal of the believer. And he will take it wherever he finds it. He will enrich himself with it wherever he finds it. He says, imagine the person that's like the one that is escaping, like he is like the one fleeing from ignorance, similar to the one that is fleeing from a lion. A lion's running after you, chasing you. Imagine for a moment. Would you care about who is telling you which way to go to get away? You're going to care? Wait, 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 who are you? Are you famous? <laughs> You're telling me, go left, go left, there's the exit. So wait, 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 do you have Instagram? <laughs> right? It says, so the one fleeing from ignorance is like the one fleeing away from a lion. 
He's not worried about the status of the one that tells him the right direction. But he will take it from whoever it is. Number two is to respect your teacher. To honor his position and status which has been bestowed upon him by Allah subhanahu and to be in his service if at all possible. That the student, they should surrender themselves to their teacher. When it comes to his teachings. They shouldn't go outside of what he is telling them. They should be like a patient with their doctor, the skilled doctor. Like the sick with their skilled doctor. The doctor tells you, you take this every six hours. What do you do? Nah. I'm just going to take it once a day. <laughs> God doesn't know what he's talking about. If that's the case, you're not ready for talab ilm. You already are shaykh. MashaAllah. You skipped the process, you became shaykh. <clears throat> and the student seeks his shaykh's counsel and advice. Seeking to gain his pleasure and acceptance. To rely upon him when it comes to his learning. And he goes above and beyond when it comes to his sanctity. And he does that for the pleasure of Allah. If you remember from last night, then we know that the scholars, they are the inheritors of the prophets. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised them in status. It is Allah that raised them in status. So that the learner and the student, they go above and beyond to preserve that sanctity. Doing this because he is carrying the knowledge of the Qur'an and the Sunnah. What he is carrying is sanctified. And because it is sanctified, you honor his sanctity and position. That you are humble with your shaykh. And your humility with him is a source of your pride. The great Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah was once criticized for the way that he would humble himself with his scholars. So he responded with a line of poetry, Uhinu lahum nafsi fahum yukrimunaha walan tukrima nafsu allati la tuhinuha He says, I humble for them my soul because they Yukrimunaha, they honor it. And the soul which is not humbled will not be honored. Right? The shaykh, your shaykh, your teacher is going to be giving you knowledge, honoring you with wisdom, imparting to you understanding. And that is honoring your soul, honoring your person. And if you have not humbled yourself to receive that, you will not receive honor. <clears throat> the next thing is that the student holds their teacher in high regard. They look at their teacher in a different way. And they assume the best. They assume the best of their teacher. They assume that he has reached a level of completeness. And doing so is the best way for them to, to achieve any benefit from them. Some of the Salaf of the past, they used to say when they would go to their shaykh, they would say, Oh Allah, Ustur Aiba Shaykhi, Ustur Aiba Shaykhi Anni, 
They say, Oh Allah, cover and conceal the faults of my shaykh and do not remove the barakah of his knowledge from me. Listen to this great Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah. He says, I used to turn the pages in front of Imam Malik, who was his shaykh, very lightly and softly. I would do it as manners to him, glorifying or exemplifying his status and position. I would do it so soft that he would not hear me turning the pages. Yes, shaykh. The student of Imam al-Shafi'i wal min jins al-amr. The reward is from the very essence of the, of the deed done, al-rabi'i, from his students. He says, I swear by Allah, ma ajra'tu an ashrab al-ma'a wa shafii yanduru ila ilayya. He says, I was unable to drink water while Imam al-Shafi'i was looking at me, honoring him and keeping his status lofty. So number four, the student should address his shaykh with terms of respect and mention him in his absence in the same way. So he says that it's not appropriate that you call upon your shaykh bita'al khitab wa kafihi. Say you, hey you, Hey you, like this in Arabic, they have this type of expression when you say anta or qara'ta, uh, did you read? Hafitha, did you read? Did you memorize? You don't address them with these simple terms, these uh, what you call uh, pronouns, if you will. But, and likewise, you don't call from a far distance, yelling, raising your voice. Shaykh! Hey! But you should call Ustadi, my teacher, Shaykhi, my Shaykh, as a term of respect and endearment. Imam al Khatib al Baghdadi, he says, they say something like, Ayyuh al Alim, O oh, you who learned one, Ayyuh al Hafiz, O oh, you who has memorized, master of the sciences, these types of terms should be used. You don't say, وَمَا تَقُولُونَ فِي كَذَا وَمَا رَأْيُكُمْ فِي كَذَا so What do you say about this? What do you think about this? But terms should be used. You should not mention him in his absence by his name unless it is coupled with that which would Illustrate his position. Your shaykh, you're talking with someone about them, you don't mention them um, as an example. Your shaykh is named Imam Ahmed. You don't say, I was at Ahmed's dars last night. Did you hear Ahmed? To your friends or your contemporaries, I was at Ahmed's dars. I was in his lesson, but you say, Shaykhi, did you go to Shaykh Ahmed's lesson to preserve the position and status? Listen, this is important now because today, perhaps more so than before, the Imams, the Mashaykh, the learned ones by the general population have been their position diminished and lowered. So it is up for the student to help elevate that position by honoring them, by putting them in the position that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed them with. You're not talking to the corner store person. You're not talking about the guy that works down the street in the office. You're not talking about normal type everyday job folk. You're talking about someone that is a leader in the deen, a master of its sciences. 
Someone that brings life to the Sharia. Ah, someone that spreads the truth. A carrier of the Quran, of the Hadith, the principles of Islamic sciences. So you use these types of terms of respect. And everyone's title is based on who they are while erring on the side of mubalagha, to be a little bit above and beyond. It doesn't hurt to go a little bit above and beyond. He may not be Shaykh al-Islam. You may not think he's Shaykh even. Sometimes we have this kind of categorization of the students of knowledge or mashayikh or the scholars. We say, no, we're not calling him Shaykh. Why is he called Shaykh? Why do they call him Shaykh? He's not a Shaykh. He's Ustad. You may think that, but to be a little bit above and beyond, there's no harm in that. Especially in their absence. Shaykh so and so. Especially in their absence in order to preserve that level and that respect among the people. Listen, in your masjid, your local masjids, regardless who the imam is, whether you like him, you don't like him, you think he's great, you think he's not great, you don't agree with what he does or whatever he does, he still has a position and it has to be honored because he's standing in front of the community leading in prayer. So you don't go around calling him by his first name in front of people. Muhammad. I was talking to Muhammad. Brother. Brother. Regardless, if he's just a normal person, he just happened to be employed to lead the prayers, that's it. There is a position here. Beyond the personality, there's a position here. He's standing fi maqam and nabi. This is the place the Prophet ﷺ stood to lead the prayers, to lead the people. He's not the nabi, no. But he's standing in a position of it. And so it has to preserve the sanctity of that position. Regardless of the situation. And that's something that has to be brought back into our culture. The dignity of these positions have to be brought back. We'll stop with what we got to stop with the last one before we break for prayer. Number five is that a person, the student of knowledge, is patient with their teacher and overlooks their faults. They are patient with their teacher. That they're patient with any uh, uh, harshness the teacher displays. They're patient with the teacher's boring lecture style. I only go to lectures where he's cracking jokes every five seconds. I want to have fun. I only go to learn if there's lots of jokes and there's screens and TVs and videos and PowerPoints, fancy colors and flashly, flash, flashy lights. The real Talib Ilm is patient with the boring lecture style. They're not after entertainment or flash, they're after what they're receiving of knowledge. We were not concerned in the past how cool, how funny, how entertaining our shayukh were. We did not rate them. Oh, he's funny, he's hilarious, he's amazing. He just, we were concerned about the benefit we would receive from them. Sometimes the teacher would maybe be a little rough with the student. He didn't memorize, he didn't complete, he didn't pronounce properly, he's making the same mistakes. He gets a little bit angry and shows his dissatisfaction. That should not be something that turns you away, but you're patient with that. And if you see some flaws in your shaykh that you try your best to overlook and read them in the best possible light to give him the benefit of the doubt in order that it will not drive you away from the benefit because the benefit that he or she possesses will outweigh the harms they will cause you. So we'll conclude with that for now. Inshallah, we'll continue after the prayer uh, with a couple more manners and then we'll discuss some of the barriers of the student of knowledge. Zakallah khair. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa tilka al-amthalu nadhribuha lin-nas
وما يعقلها إلا العالمون